Welcome once again to Understanding Your Bible. These messages are developed with the purpose in mind of giving you information that will better help you understand your Bible. To many people, the Word of God is full of mysteries and full of things that are hard to be understood, and yet the Bible really is not a very difficult book. The Bible, I've heard said by many, is written in sixth grade English, and I believe that to be true. And I believe the Bible can be understood. Now, obviously, there are some things that are more difficult than others. But I believe there's a key to understanding your Bible. For many years, I was involved in a religious system, and I had many questions about what seemed to be contradictions in the Bible. I would read over in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John certain scriptures, and I would have questions about those because I would read over in Paul's epistles other doctrine that seemed to contradict what was being said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then, as a young man, I came to the knowledge of the truth as far as rightly dividing the word of truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I believe that that is the key to understanding your Bible. I believe that's the key that under, unlocks the mystery and the mystique about the Word of God. I believe that if you will consider the fact that Paul wrote 13 epistles, and in those 13 epistles, as Dr. E.I. Schofield, which wrote the Schofield Bible, said, on his note in Ephesians chapter 3, he said that the doctrine, the position... Uh, the walk for the church, the body of Christ, is found in Paul's epistles alone. And that is true. Throughout this study, I've pointed out to you that uh, most everybody divides the Bible somewhere. I have a chart here, and on this chart I have listed, first of all, the Old Testament, and I didn't put all the books there, uh, but the, this portion of the chart would represent the Old Testament. And then there are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The next book in the Bible, obviously, is the book of Acts. And then the next 13 books in the Bible are is Romans through Philemon, followed by Hebrews through Revelation. Now, the 13 books that Paul wrote are the doctrine for the church, the body of Christ. And if you will seriously read and consider uh, and believe the Bible, I believe that you would see that to, to acknowledge that fact would certainly clear up a lot of confusion about the Word of God. I'm very thankful for the knowledge of the Word of God rightly divided because it does clear up so much confusion. Number one, about salvation. Number two, about our walk. Number three, about the things that we're to be doing during this present age. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that Christ taught the disciples to do over in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we don't do today. Uh, the doctrine for our dispensation is in Romans through Philemon, given to the Apostle Paul, and Paul himself makes that very clear. I want you to notice today as we begin in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. The Apostle Paul is concluding his letter to the Romans, the first letter that we have in the order of Paul's epistles, not the first one written, uh, but the first one in the order in the canon of scriptures. And as Paul concludes the letter to the Romans, in chapter 16, verse 25, he says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. It's interesting that Paul makes a reference to the gospel of the grace of God in Acts 20, 24. And here he calls that gospel my gospel. Well, there's a reason for that. It's because that gospel, as we pointed out in previous studies, was given to the Apostle Paul to reveal that to you and I. In Romans chapter 16, verse 25, he says, Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel. And then he says, And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now, the Apostle Paul says here that he is preaching, and he wants people to be established according to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. Well, 
if, it's the, if it was a mystery, it must have been something that was previously unknown. And that's exactly the case. You see, he says, number one, my gospel. Number two, he says, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, most everybody in all denominations preach Jesus Christ. There are those that, that talk an awful lot about Jesus Christ and His earthly ministry. There are those that put a lot of emphasis on the man of Galilee. And, and you see these bumper stickers like my boss is a Jewish carpenter. And they put a lot of emphasis upon the life of Christ. Well, Paul said that his preaching was according to the revelation of the mystery. He preached Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And so we want to see what is that mystery. In Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 1, Paul begins there, he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now that is the mystery of Ephesians chapter 3. What is that mystery of Ephesians 3? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. You say, but wait a minute, wasn't Gentile salvation always available in the Bible? Wasn't it always possible for Gentiles to be saved? Well, yes it was, but there was a qualification to the Gentile salvation in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want you to notice with me in Matthew chapter 10, uh, he says uh, Jesus Christ is sending out the twelve. In Matthew chapter 10, he sends them out and they are to go out preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We talked about that gospel of the kingdom for uh, two lessons already. And we saw that that gospel of the kingdom is the gospel that we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the first part of Acts and is associated with the nation Israel. It's the gospel that Christ preached. It's the gospel that John the Baptist preached. It's the gospel that Peter and the other disciples preached. But it is not the gospel that Paul preached. Paul preached the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God. Now in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, the Bible says, Now these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now notice, when he sent them out, he sent them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Bible says that Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 15, uh, in Matthew chapter 15, in verse 21, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Lord, have mercy, O Lord, thy son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Uh, she said, have mercy on me. In other words, she's crying out to God for, for mercy. Verse 23, But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, Notice, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Isn't that amazing that Jesus Christ, who was the compassionate, loving Son of God, said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and, cast, and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. In other words, the idea there, folks, is that a Gentile, in order to be saved, they had to take a place of submission. This woman said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Uh, in Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, there's, an another, there's another account of a man who uh, was a centurion. In Luke chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. 
And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. Why? For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. And down in verse 9 it says, When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. But did you notice that the reason that Jesus Christ answered the man's prayer was because in verse 5 they said, He loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. In other words, the Gentile salvation was based upon acknowledging the nation Israel as the people of God and coming to Christ through Israel. You say, well, what about uh, a man like Cornelius over in Acts chapter 10? Well, you know, Peter is instructed in Acts chapter 1 to be a witness unto those things which he had been taught by Christ. But he was told to start in Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then go unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is saved. And in Acts chapter 10, we find that Peter is summoned to go to the house of Cornelius. It's interesting that Cornelius in Acts 10 too is said to be a devout man and one that feared God with all of his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always, much like the man over there in Luke chapter 7. One that feared God, one that worked righteousness. And so Peter, after rece having received the vision from God that he should not call anything unclean, he goes down to the household of Cornelius. And he preaches there to Cornelius, and he talks to Cornelius. And it's interesting, he says there in verse 35, In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. You know, Peter, when he went down to the house of Cornelius, he was a little confused himself about why he was even going. Uh, he says there in verse, uh, 30, in verse 30, Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the night hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and now it's well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. You see, Peter did not desire to be there. Peter did not believe that it was even right for him to be there. He said that uh, uh, it's not right for me to go to a man of another nation. But God was opening the door uh, to Gentile salvation, but it was through the nation Israel at this time. And so when Peter opened his mouth, he said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, we see that there was Gentile salvation, but it was for those that feared God and worked righteousness. The mystery is that today salvation is available to all, all men without distinction. As a matter of fact, it's interesting when you compare the message of Peter with that of the Apostle Paul. Uh, in Titus chapter 3, uh, in verse 3, 4 and 5, Paul is talking about the salvation that we have today in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to notice, I want you to compare what are, what's said here in these verses. And notice they are exactly opposite. This is what I was talking about, how the scriptures seem to contradict themselves if you don't understand that there are scriptures that are associated with the church, the body of Christ, and those that are associated completely and totally with the nation Israel. Acts 10 verse 24, or verse 34 and 35 again. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
You see, he included their works of righteousness. He said it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you fear God and you work righteousness, you're accepted with him. One of those works of righteousness would be like Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, repentance, water baptism, all included in the gospel of the kingdom. But notice what Paul said in Titus chapter 3, verse 4. He said, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now do you see how that is exactly the opposite of what Peter said? Peter said, I perceive that in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Paul said, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. You see, the revelation of the mystery that was given to the Apostle Paul opened the door of salvation to all men. Why, in Acts chapter 13, a passage that uh, we've mentioned several times here on the, uh, in these Bible studies, but in Acts 13, in Paul's first recorded message, in verse 38, as he's preaching in the synagogue, he says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, if any man committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, there was no forgiveness for them in this world nor in that to come. But Paul was given the revelation of mystery. Paul was given the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul said, to, under this message, there's forgiveness for all sins from which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. Notice what Paul says concerning himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now notice in verse 16, this is very important. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You say, well, what is Paul talking about? Was he the first man ever saved? No, he wasn't the first man ever saved, but he was the first man ever saved in the manner in which he was saved. He was the first man saved totally and completely by the grace of God. Before Paul's salvation, there was keeping the law. There was water baptism. There was repentance. There was forsaking all that you have. All of those things that we talked about associated with the gospel of the kingdom. But when God revealed himself to Paul, God revealed to Paul, Paul, when Christ died on that cross, he died for your sins. He was buried. He was raised again the third day. And Paul said he was raised again for our justification. And Paul says right here that he was the first. He was a pattern. Now listen, folks, this is not hard to be understood. You know what a pattern is. You know that when a woman begins to make a dress uh, or a suit or any piece of clothing, she starts with a pattern. If you're going to build a house, you start with a pattern. You start with an architectural drawing. Well, Paul said, For this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So when Paul began to preach, Paul began to preach a new gospel, a new revelation. And that revelation was the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Paul began to reveal that Jesus Christ, not only was he the Son of God, 
Not only was he the Messiah that was promised to the nation Israel, not only was he proven to be the Messiah by his resurrection from the dead, but when he died on that cross, God revealed to Paul that when he died on that cross, he died for the sins of all men. And no longer would there be a distinction between Jew and Gentile. No longer would there be a distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. As a matter of fact, in Galatians chapter 1, in verse 11, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then in Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says, When I went up by, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now notice down in verse uh, 6, But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrawise, now notice, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Not the gospel to the circumcision. It is the gospel of the uncircumcision, he says, was committed unto me, and the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Well, what was that gospel of the circumcision? Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 10, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. What is that gospel of the uncircumcision? that not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. That gospel is the good news for today, that whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, bond or free, male or female, black or white, it makes no difference what color you are, what race, what creed, what denomination. God today is saving all men on the basis of not who they are or what they are, but on the basis of what they believe. Jesus Christ hung on that cross. The Bible said that God made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God today is saving people based on what they believe, whether or not they will trust in what his son, Jesus Christ, did for them on Calvary. And so when Paul said that he was preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the idea there is that there was a dispensation given to Paul. He said, the dispensation of the grace of God is given me to you. Well, that dispensation, folks, is, the, is found in the doctrine for that dispensation, rather, is found in Romans through Philemon, the books that Paul wrote. And everybody today that gets saved in the dispensation of the grace of God gets saved the same way. You know, for years, I heard this thing about, well, we're all going to heaven. We're just taking different roads to get there. Well, the sad truth is that that is just not right. That is not true. There's only one way today that a person can be saved. And that is by, number one, acknowledging that they're a sinner. And number two, acknowledging that there was a man 2,000 years ago, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible says he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And that man, Christ Jesus, hung on a cross, bore our sin, became our sin, the Bible says, and died for our sins. And God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. And when a person believes that and trusts in that, the Bible says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. It's not water baptism that places you in the body of Christ. It's spirit baptism. Paul said there's just one baptism, Ephesians chapter 4, and that one baptism is the baptism that's associated with the church, the body of Christ. There were at least three or four that were associated with Israel that are outlined in Matthew 3. There's only one that's associated with the church, the body of Christ. That's spirit baptism, and it places you into the body of Christ so that today it doesn't make any difference whether you're a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or whatever it might be that you call yourself, if you have trusted Jesus Christ, you're in the body of Christ. If you haven't, you're not. 
And if you're not in the body of Christ, you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And the only hope for you is not to join another church, not to quit doing something else or put on uh, some other good works. The only hope for you is to come to the end of yourself and quit trying to save yourself and trust in what Jesus Christ did for you. That was the whole purpose in God giving this message to the Apostle Paul so that people like you and I would have the hope of salvation by grace through faith. He said in the dispensation that was given unto him that people would be saved by the gospel, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Not by works of righteousness, not by joining the church, not by confessing your sins, not by turning over a new leaf, not by doing better, not by giving of your money, by the gospel. That gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul said, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures that he was buried, and that he was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. He has forgiven you all trespasses based on what he did at the cross. Would you right now, if you never have, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and receive him as your Savior, the one who died for you, loved you, and gave himself for you that you might be saved? Grace Bible Church extends to you and your family a cordial invitation to join us for our Sunday services. Bible classes begin at 10 a.m. with morning service at 11 and informal evening Bible study at 6 p.m. For more information, phone 847-0768. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Understanding Your Bible. For more information, write to the address on your screen or call 423-847-0768. Be sure to be with us again next week for another edition of Understanding Your Bible.